So, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, this is a long time coming, this project. And um, for those of you who don't know, I'm John Mack. I am the artist of A Species Between Worlds, Our Nature, Our Screens. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also the founder of Life Calling, a nonprofit that I started um, earlier this year, uh, which is dedicated to preserving our humanity in the digital age. And this is going to sound kind of weird, but you all right now, from where I'm standing, you're sort of sitting on a runway. And six years ago, I started this project. I had an idea. And I knew it so clearly. It was so crystal clear what I wanted to do. And I was so excited about it. I felt like this little kid. And I remember I would tell my friends what I'm going to do, and the art community, and my family. And I was just, I'm going to travel the world and take pictures of Pokemon. And these people would look at me and just captivated. And I knew just from the direct, their reaction, they were thinking, what in the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> and um, regardless, I decided to fly with this idea with the knowing that at some point this world would open a runway for this idea to land. And so you sit here right now as witnesses to the landing of an idea that is an, ex is an extremely big deal to me and to my team, a, an amazing team that I've put together over the past six years. Uh, these are the mechanics who made sure the plane was flying and the builders who made sure that this runway was constructed. And I want to add to this list uh, the host committee members who helped with this night tonight. So let's begin this little talk that I have here with a big round of applause for all of them. So, in order for a runway to be built, you first need the land that it's going to be built on. And on that note, I need to thank my dear friend, Nicholas Silvers, who has always believed in me. And I'd like to thank his company, Tavros Capital Partners, for providing the real estate for this runway. I'd also like to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies. <laughs> Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And on behalf of Life Calling, I'd like to thank the fiscal sponsor, the Giving Back Fund. So we've been open here for about a week now, and I've given a few private tours. And the question inevitably pops up, it's, John, how did all this happen? And so I want to take you on a slight little tour of how this all came to be. And the reality is, is that six years ago, 2016, I was actually located here, sitting on this, no joke, no joke, <laughs> holding this, holding this, reading this. Yahoo News, rare Pokemon sparks stampede in Taipei. And all of a sudden, this idea popped into my mind. Who would have known that with this idea on this toilet, I would, in six years, travel over 300,000 air miles aboard more than 200 flights, driving more than 15,000 miles with the aid of 25 car rentals, hiking more than 220 miles, seven hel helicopter flights, six seaplane flybys, eight grizzly sightings, one husky sled, not to mention this runway tonight. Now, in order to understand why that happened, you have to understand what Pokemon Go is. And I'm gonna get into it very, very briefly. So Pokemon Go is an augmented reality gaming app that uses geolocation technology to display and project digital creatures over the natural world. And it's up to the gamer, the objective of the gamer is to collect as many of these creatures as possible. Now, not knowing what a Pokemon Go stampede looked like, I went to YouTube and it brought me here to the streets of Taipei, where an intersection was at a complete standstill 
as hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people chased a rare Pokemon. And I'm gonna show you this video right now. Now, people said to me, John, no one's gonna care about this because Pokemon Go is just a fad. But it's not Pokemon Go that interested me. What interested me here was human behavior. What interested me was intelligent life putting their immediate reality on hold to chase a figment of their mobile device's imagination. What interested me here was intelligent life chasing nothing. Now, history has shown time and again that this is no fad, that when the human is thrown the precise tailored bait, we run to it as if our lives depended on it. And I'm gonna show you another stampede of a different kind. Michael Jackson fan hysteria. Now here the bait is not of the digital device, but of the psychological device, a virtual value in fame. Here's another stampede, the Nazi march. Again, this, is, this bait is not from the digital device, but from the psyche device, a virtual belief in a scapegoat. So when we look here at those two constructs, we're seeing that augmented reality runs analogous to projections of the psyche. So the digital device runs analogous to the psyche device. So when we look at this screen here, that Pokemon, given everything I've just said, that Pokemon is nothing more than a belief, the worship of a thought. Here's another screen of what Pokemon Go does, and this is actually what you see here in the exhibition. Pokemon Go makes virtual recreations of your immediate environment. So on the left there, you see the natural ocean, and on the phone, you see the fake ocean. Here's a better image that you could, this is me in Guatemala. So I'm tethered to that avatar. So when I move, that avatar moves with me. And the question is, can the human operate and navigate both worlds at once? This is a story of two adult men walking off a cliff in Encinitas, California, playing Pokemon Go. Here's a woman texting, walking down the sidewalk. So here's the question, tool or reality? When we pick up these devices, are they our tools or have we given it the power of reality? Now, when those two men walked off that cliff in California, their psyche device merged with the image of the digital device and they projected that landscape over their immediate environment. This is what their landscape looked like when they walked off that cliff. Consciousness merged with the algorithm. This is not augmented reality. This is replaced reality. And the human right now is really at a metaphysical crossroads in the same way that scientists today are saying that our outer environment is reaching a tipping point with global warming and climate change, where once crossed this threshold, we won't be able to return back to how nature was. The same is true for our inner environment. The human right now is reaching a tipping point that when crossed, we will not be able to return back to what it means to be human. And the fact is, the essence of what's going on here is, when we consume these constructs, we are turning our backs to nature. Turning our backs to nature. Turning our backs to nature. And so I decided to face nature and travel around the world. And I went to over 50 US national parks. I'm based in Sevilla, Spain, so there was a lot of extra traveling just to get to the United States. 50 US national parks in the seven wonders of the natural world. And when I'm there, what I do is I take two photographs. I'll go to a nice spot. So here's me in the field. I will take a picture with my normal camera and photograph the, nat the natural landscape. And then I will load up Pokemon Go and I will take a screenshot of that landscape and I remove the avatar and all that other stuff. And what I do is I hang that virtual image on the wall. And so when you hold your phone up to it, the camera with the app that I've made for this exhibition, you see the natural image 
on the phone. So I'm reversing the augmented reality equation. So people say to me, if this is about connecting to nature again, why do you have technology so involved in this? And I said, I'm not against technology. What I'm saying is this, in the same way that a hammer can be turned around with a reverse grip and take out the nail, or the way a screwdriver with reverse twist can take out the screw, can these devices be held with a reverse grip to undo the damage that they're causing? What damage? These devices are amplifying everything we already have going on in the psyche. It is amplifying duality, conflict, separation, destruction. It is a mirror of amplification. It is a mirror of our internal artifice that we've accepted as truth. And the question is, can we return this tool, not just to its tool function, but to the ultimate tool, which would be what? A device that actually shows us where we are misaligned so that it can redirect us back to our true nature. And on that note, this uh, month here of September, uh, we have a month-long forum with incredible speakers, um, topics about digital technology, what that means to our humanity. Uh, it's all free. If you go to uh, www.aspeciesbetweenworlds.com, you can sign up, just reserve your free seats. And just sort of as a side note, I used to live in the Mexican rainforest. I did a project for two years just on the Guatemalan border, photographing a, an indigenous Mayan group. And every week, we would uh, get under sort of a palapa thatched roof, and we would discuss with the community some of the problems, the weather, uh, the harvest, the community. And it was beautiful because it was time to reconnect. It was the place of reunion, and it was done within the embrace of nature. And so where you sit today, this is for New York, the town square, where we come together and discuss the community, where we're going, and how to change the path that we're going. And all of this within the embrace of these images of nature. So unfortunately, one of the people who, who couldn't come to this forum is this man, Yuval Noah Harari, who is a historian, author of the book, Sapiens. But we did a, a conversation together um, which we'll screen here. We'll have a premiere here, I think, on September 16th. And I'd like to share with you just a, a quick clip. Back in 2016, I, I, I read an article about something called a Pokemon Go stampede. Are you familiar with the game Pokemon Go? Yes, very much. I didn't know what that even looked like, so I went to YouTube, and it took me to the streets of Taipei. Mm -hmm. And it's an intersection where traffic had, be, had come to a complete standstill as thousands of people were running to chase a Pokemon, a rare Pokemon. It was intelligent life putting their immediate reality on hold to chase a figment of their device's imagination. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, if you envision this sort of mass, what it looked like was a mass migration of humanity leaving something mm -hmm. and going towards something else, the virtual construct. Mm -hmm. Would you have any idea, or maybe we could even get into it together, what is it that we're running away from? Um. <laughs> September 16th, uh, we'll do the premiere here and I'll be sticking around for question and answers after that. I'm gonna go back to this list again because there's actually one more thank you that I need to include here. Uh, my daughter, Lucia, is here. She's 15 years old. Six years of that life has been enduring a father that only talks about Pokemon Go. And I want to thank her for her support and for her encouragement. But I also want to thank her for another thing. With her and the new generation, I see hope. And this exhibition and this effort is dedicated as much to her as it is to me, 
as it is to everyone in this room and everyone outside of this room. This effort is a dedication. This effort God, is a dedication to life, to love, and to our humanity. And uh, in closing here, if there's one thing that you take away from this talk, this exhibition, and this month, it is this. The next time you are somewhere in the world, sitting here, holding this, just play Wordle. <laughs> Don't make it complicated. In all seriousness, if there's one thing to take from all of this, it is this, and you can spread it. If I didn't know 100% that we could make this right. None of this would exist right now. So spread the word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.